All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I, again, I was really, really looking forward to being here in person with you. Unfortunately, I brought brought a little bit of a gift back from Belgium. And let, let's put it this way. My wife appreciated this a lot less than the chocolates. Um, <laughs> but in any case, the um, uh, it's, it's a re always a real pr uh, privilege to be able to uh, talk with people about probably the topic that I'm most passionate about, which is quantum simulation. So what the aim of this talk is going to be is I'm, it's just going to be entirely a whiteboard uh, talk. The reason why is I want it to be interactive. I find that giving this type of a talk with a set of fixed slides, it's really easy for me to just show you all of the equations, but sometimes it's a lot harder to get the intuition behind all of this. So what I want to do is I want to take you through the basics in order to be able to get you up to the point where you can actually be a practitioner in the field of quantum simulation. And in particular, what I aim to do is I aim to teach you how Trotter Suzuki simulations end up working and also how more advanced ideas such as uh, cubitization and linear combinations of unitaries can be used in order to solve problems in quantum simulation and beyond. And so many of these tools uh, I found are useful in general for algorithm uh, development because, well, looking at quantum simulation, you might just think, oh, this is going to be a, a talk about chemistry. It's actually subtly not. This is actually, quantum simulation is actually giving you a new way of solving a different class of compilation problems. So I'll present it that way, and then we'll, we'll go into some of the more practical stuff uh, later. Um, also, the other thing is, is that my main aim is to make sure that all of you walk away with something from this. And so to, to that end, I think it's more important that you stop and interrupt me as soon as you have any questions about anything, because I, you know, it, I always find that if I can learn one thing from every lecture that I've been to, I'm doing really well. So, you know, if, but please help me get that one thing into your brain by stopping me at any time. So taking a step back, right, why quantum simulation? What, well, what's the origin of this? Now, the origin of quantum simulation originally was kind of articulated uh, by Feynman. And so, you know, this is, this is Feynman over here. And you can tell it's Feynman because there's a pair of bongo drums over there. Um, uh, clearly, clearly my, my, uh, art was the, my best subject in high school. Um, but in any case, the Feynman ended up noticing something very strange about quantum mechanics. And that strange thing is that if you consider the state space that you end up getting for say two spins that are interacting with each other, this is, you know, a, a state psi, which is in a two dimensional Hilbert space. This might be a state phi, which is in also a two-dimensional Hilbert space. But when you combine the two, the composite quantum state is in um, a Hilbert space that is two squared dimensions. And in general, if we ended up getting a state of n spins interacting here, then the vector that we're looking at is in C2 to the n. And this ends up saying something really strange and interesting. What it ends up saying is that small numbers of interacting quantum systems live in a state space that is in absolutely enormous. So to give you an idea, right? Let's say we uh, wanted to simulate a, um, um, a, a cup of water. A cup of water is roughly speaking going to contain 10 to the 23rd um, atoms, you know, which is probably on the order of like 10 to the 24 electrons. Okay, so now if we just look at the spin degree of freedom for this, the size of the vector that we would need to describe just this one tiny itsy bitsy little piece of the universe would be a Hilbert space of dimension two to the 10 to the 24. And that is absolutely an astounding um, um, amount of memory that would be needed in order to store the state vector. And okay, so why is that weird? 
or interesting? Well, from a philosophical perspective, the way that I like thinking about this and, you know, is that if we consider the, the world, which, you know, probably looks something like this. Oh, I guess there's this like Europe part over here and stuff. <laughs> um, but in any case, all of this, really, if we like to, to think about it, I like to think of the entire universe as a computational system that has a number of inputs and a number of outputs, i.e. the universe simulates itself. Now, if we think about the universe as a gi gigantic simulation, the question is, you know, what is, would be the computational power needed to, in order to be able to simulate the universe? Now, what this suggests is that if the universe is fundamentally solving the Schrodinger equation for all things, then it would have to have be a Turing machine of absolutely absurd power to be able to simulate the Schrodinger equation as we conventionally write it for those atoms. And this is fascinating because it begs the question, where does the universe hide its computational power and what characterizes the computational power of the universe? This approach over here really ends up, or this argument over here, really forms the foundation of, of what we end up calling the quantum church Turing thesis which is the belief that the universe or all reasonable models of computing more broadly really shouldn't be thought of as a giant Turing machine that is storing vectors of this absurd dimension, but instead actually is a quantum computer processing quantum information. And so what simulation then is about is it gives us a way of addressing this question. If we end up having a molecule over here that is evolving according to the rules of quantum mechanics. This allows us to ask the question, well, what is the cost of uh, simulating quantum um, mechanics uh, for even just an atom? And for systems even of a small number of atoms, this it can, be, it can be incredibly daunting. And one of the aims of quantum simulation is really to be able to place bounds, upper and lower bounds, on what the cost of any quantum computer uh, doing such a simulation would be. And also, you know, to be able to ask, well, are there practical applications? Can we do interesting things in the case of chemistry or other areas? And one of the benchmark problems that my collaborators and I came up with is this problem of... Um, FOMOCO. Okay, just to give you an idea about, you know, what um, uh, practical things uh, could be done with this. Now, FOMOCO is, um, is something that's really interesting. What it is, is it is a, the active site of a, um, uh, for a particular reaction that ends up being catalyzed using this enzyme called nitrogenase. And the, the reaction that's being catalyzed is, by this is uh, essentially biological nitrogen fixation. And so what we do uh, over there is we have something like what? We've got N2, uh, I guess, I'll put an X and Y here because I don't trust my brain to um, uh, get the right stoichiometric ratios. Um, but what we want to do is we want to convert this over to ammonia in the end. And the standard way that this is done uh, industrially is using the Haber process. The Haber process, invented by Fritz Haber, is one of the most important um, chemical processes that's been uh, developed to date. It, it single-handedly actually kept Germany in the First World War by giving a artificial way in order to be able to make munitions, um, when previously people would have to actually you know, mine many of the nitrates that were needed for it. This process allowed it allowed them to make it literally from natural gas and um, nitrogen in the air, and also it's responsible for the about um, one percent of a uh, global energy usage. So basically, almost all the fertilizer that we use in order to maintain our crops is produced uh, by the Haber process. And to give you an idea of also its importance for fertilizer, 
Um, if some of you might have heard the term the dismal science used to refer to economics, this came about because of an economist by the name of Malthus who predicted that at the end of the 19th century, we'd run out of food production. Uh, and actually, he wasn't wrong. But the thing that Malthus didn't consider is technological innovation, like the Haber process, which gave us a way of uh, making scalably fertilizer at the price, though, of an increasingly large amount of energy being used uh, just to end up making uh, the ammonia that we need to feed the world. So this is a major thing. And the reason why th this process ends up uh, happening is because of the fact that um, um, nitrogen, if you think about it, is this diatomic molecule that has an incredibly strong triple bond between it. And in order to be able to break it up and push this over to NH4, we've got to figure out a way of slicing that triple bond down the middle. Now, the way engineers do it is the way engineers do many things, through brute frickin' force. <laughs> so the, what they do is they put this under intense pressure, uh, something like around 900 uh, atmosphere, and, uh, and very, very high uh, temperatures in order to be able to provide enough energy to slice that bond. And this is the reason why it ends up using about 1% of global energy because of these uh, resources needed in order to be able to make ammonia. Okay, cool, fantastic. I, I've just wasted your, your lives talking about ammonia. Um, why, why is this relevant? Well, the reason why it's relevant is because of this molecule, um, uh, FOMOCO, which sits at the center of this nitrogenase enzyme, because bacteria have actually figured out a way of building a catalyst that acts essentially as a molecular knife to split that triple bond down the middle. And that's what FOMOCO ends up doing. It allows the, the bacteria to be able to produce uh, ammonia at, um, at room temperature and pressure. So the only problem with it is that this, this process ends up uh, is incredibly sensitive to oxygen. So it doesn't actually end up working at an industrial scale. It only works well inside a cell membrane. And unfortunately, also, we don't actually understand why it works. The reason why we don't understand uh, uh, why it works is because of the fact that it ends up forming this uh, iron molybdenum um, uh, complex in the middle. And what happens when you end up having incredibly heavy um, atoms inside of molecules, you tend to have this effect known as strong correlation. This ends up happening because the electrons, which you can envision circling the, the atoms, they end up getting sucked in to, a tight, to tighter and tighter orbits as the charges end up increasing. And that causes the electrons to now become much more strongly interacting with each other because they're all compressed physically into a, a smaller space. And the amount of entanglement that we need in order to be able to describe this system ends up becoming quite large. In fact, too large for knowing classical methods to do a good job of modeling these systems. And so in order for us to be able to solve this problem, we really kind of uh, accurately, at least, we need quantum effects to be treated very accurately. And so this is one of the, the best applications that's been found to date for quantum computing. And the idea basically behind how we would use quantum simulation to solve this problem is we essentially end up taking this a molecular model of this Hamel, um, system and we map it into a, a set of qubits inside our quantum computer. And then we'll simu we simulate the dynamics of this. So in, in some sense, what we're doing is we're tricking our quantum computer into thinking that it's that molecule. And then by measuring the qubits in an appropriate way, and I'll show you how to do that soon, we can actually extract all the relevant information that we would get from performing an experiment just by measuring the qubits in our quantum computer that are logically equivalent to the electrons in the system that we're simulating. So in that sense, we're kind of building the molecule inside our quantum computer. 
and probing it in order to understand it. And the dream would be that by simulating the molecule, uh, molecule like this on a quantum computer, we might be able to understand the mechanism by which um, this iron molybdenum complex ends up um, severing the triple bond for nitrogen to lead to cheap uh, ammonia production. And to give you an idea about the cost of this, uh, and this is this is about the the currently the record for for quantum simulation here. We need about on the order of a billion quantum gate operations to be able to carry this out. And with quantum error correction, um, this corresponds to about on the order of two hundred logical qubits. And it with exist with slightly better uh, error rates. Uh, translating this through uh, the surface code, this is about on the order of 1 million physical qubits. So to put this in perspective, where are we right now? With quantum computers physically, we've made huge strides in the last couple of years. We've gotten to the point where uh, devices like the IBM uh, quantum experience has 127 physical qubits. And with the gate error rates that we, we've got at the moment, um, we can do circuits that are, you know, have a depth less than or equal to about 100 gates. So the moral of the story is, is that we're a long way off from where we need to be for this. And this is one of the reasons why quantum simulation is so important now. Uh, to look at because these are compelling applications that we can do that are much more relevant uh, for many people's lives than uh, something like um, uh, violating people's privacy using Shor's algorithm. This really could change the world, but there's a huge gulf between where we are right now uh, on the order of about 100 gates and the billion gates that we need to do it. And the development of increasingly advanced simulation methods, as well as better forms of quantum error correction, will be needed in order for us to bridge this gap. And so my aim is to be able to teach you, you know, the, the general art of, uh, of this process. And that basically what that art is, is the art of translating a physical system into um, a sequence of instructions that tricks the quantum computer into thinking that it's that physical system. But before I begin, does anybody have any questions? Cool. Okay. Well, please interrupt me later because I know for a fact I wasn't I wasn't crystal clear there. So let's begin with this the abstract notion of uh, of uh, quantum simulation. So let's uh, let's define what the problem is. Okay, so in general, what we have is quantum simulation is often taken to be synonymous with the term Hamiltonian simulation. So let's assume we have a Hamiltonian. And there's many ways I can state this. A Hamiltonian is basically a Hermitian matrix, meaning that the matrix H is equal to its own conjugate transpose. Um, and let's assume that the Hamiltonian can be written in the following form, sum over i, um, a, i, u, i, for an appropriate set of unitary operations. Our task is to implement e to the minus i, h, t. Um, we want to approximate this um, with a product of gates gj such that the uh, operator norm of e to the minus i h t minus pi gjg is uh, less than or equal to epsilon using a minimal number of Okay, and here in general, uh, H, we, we would like to think of 
as being a um, complex uh, two to the n by two to the n. Um, oh, whoops, uh, two. Blame that on the COVID. Um, a, a complex uh, two to the n by two to the n matrix. So basically, high level. Um, that's the that's the statement of the problem. And let me just motivate this particular form over here. Where does this come from? Well, for those of you who've done a lot of physics, it, it, it's second nature, but not everybody comes to quantum computing from a physics background. Um, so if you're coming from it from more of a computer science background, this ends up coming about because this is the solution to the fundamental differential equation of quantum mechanics, which is known as the uh, Schrodinger equation. Okay, the Schrodinger equation ends up taking the, the following form. It gives you the time evolution of a quantum state via the solution to the following uh, equation. D psi of t by dt is equal to um, negative i h psi of t. Here, I've assumed for simplicity that h is time independent. So there's no functional dependence on this matrix h. Um, it's, it gets just a little bit more complicated, but nothing conceptually changes when we do this. This H over here, again, is what we call the Hamiltonian. And physically, the Hamiltonian, it, the Hamiltonian can be interpreted as the energy operator. And it has the property that for any state psi, the sandwich of psi with h in the middle, this is equal to the average energy for the system. So how does this work in general? If you want to simulate a particular um, um, Hamiltonian, like a physical one, like chemistry, for example, what you would do is you would talk to a chemist or you talk to a, a physicist they'll give you a specific representation of that Hamiltonian that conforms to this form up here. And then your job is to solve this particular uh, problem in here. So from that perspective, actually, the problem of simulation is a compilation problem. Now, normally, compilation problems you think of in the following way, right? Let's say that I what I wanted to do is, you know, I wanted to, uh, I've got a unitary matrix, um, let's say uh, cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta. And I'd like to be able to convert this over here to uh, individual gates. Well, in this case, it's pretty easy. It's just actually an RY rotation. But in, in general, the problem usually for compilation is the following. You know the matrix U, where this is U, and you want to find a uh, gate sequence uh, uh, product over J, GJ, such that the difference between that is less than or equal to epsilon for some epsilon greater than zero that you'd like to pick. Okay, so this is a normal compilation problem that we have to solve all the time when we're trying to translate a unitary matrix that we want to build into a sequence of discrete gates that our quantum computer actually has. So the key thing is, is that we know what U is. Now, let's take a look at the Hamiltonian simulation. The solution to the Hamiltonian simulation problem over here, it can actually be rewritten in a different way. If we define psi of t, to be equal to some F unitary matrix, U of T, this thing is known as the time evolution operator. Then by plugging this into the Schrodinger uh, um, equation, we end up getting the following differential equation. D by DT of U of T is equal to negative I H U of T. And the solution to this is just u of t equals e to the minus i h t. 
So what this ends up saying is this ends up saying that if we want to find a time evolved state at time t, all we need to do is put in an initial psi of zero and apply e to the minus i h t to it. And then we'll end up getting the final state. The problem with the simulation problem you is that we know h and t, but not e to the minus i h t. And what we want is we want to find the um, uh, a sequence of gates G, uh, gj such that the norm of e to the minus i h t minus the product over those gates is less than or equal to epsilon. So it's very similar to the general compilation problem. The difference is, is what we know. We know the exponent of the unitary. We know this h and t, with the, but we don't know the form of the, the matrix itself. Uh, in the standard compilation problem, we know uh, u, but we don't know uh, this. And so why is this fair? Like, wh why, why can't we just figure this out? Well, let's take a look at what e to the minus ihg is. We can write this as the sum from j equals zero to infinity of negative i h t to the j over j factorial. So if we wanted to figure out the matrix elements of this, uh, this operator, what we'd have to do is we'd have to, at second order, we'd have to compute, um, oh, let's have, let me actually just do this to set at least second order. This is minus i h t minus h squared t squared over two factorial, so on and so forth. To find this term, what we have to do is we have to multiply two, um, two to the n by two to the n matrices. And so explicitly coming up with an expression, even if we know what h is, for what u is, is extremely difficult. In fact, this problem is so difficult that in general, we don't believe quantum computers can actually figure out all these matrix elements precisely. So it's kind of a weird version of a compilation problem because we know the generator of the unitary that we want to build, but we don't know the unitary. And, um, and the art really behind all of this is to come up with tactics that are going to allow us to compile this evolution over here into a sequence of gates um, without needing to know that information. And surprisingly, you can do it. Now, um, any, any, any questions here? Um, so uh, are these approaches limited to, I mean, just a Schrodinger equation, or can we map this onto other <coughs> physical simulation things like Limblad or code sharp stuff? Okay. So Limblad, no. The stuff that I'm going to be teaching you today, not directly. Um, the big problem is that, you know, if you're taking a look at the uh, dynamics uh, that you end up getting from a master equation, it's non-unitary. And so you have to think, because quantum computers only natively know how to do unitary dynamics, you're not going to be able to come up with this direct mapping between the, uh, the, the, the channel that you would end up getting in an open quantum system and the unitaries that you can actually pull off on the quantum computer. So instead, what you need to do is you need to embed that, um, <clears throat> that channel as a, a unitary in a higher dimensional space and then go through that compilation. Um, specifically, the technique, and I'm going to mention it, a linear combination of unitaries can be used to pull it off, but simulations of master equations are uh, much more subtle than the closed quantum system uh, simulation that I'm going to be talking about and still is an active area of research. So you can tackle it, but it's much more complicated, and the formalism that I'm primarily focusing on doesn't it doesn't really address it. Does that make sense? Thank you. Um, can you comment on analog quantum simulation in this? Context? Oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so I've got a reputation when it comes to analog simulation. 
All right. So unfortunately, you 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 forced me to pull uh, to to talk about my controversial views on analog simulation. So my view on analog simulation is unfortunately uh, the idea behind analog simulation is really simple in in some uh, some way. Uh, let's say that what I wanted to do is I wanted to simulate um, uh, two. I wanted to simulate H two. Okay. So this is. We've got two protons over here, and you know we've got some uh, electrons. Let's say you know we're talking about like you know a sigma bond that we want to do, which, if I recall right, looks kind of like that. Um, so in any case, the um, the idea behind it would be you've got these two electrons that are floating around inside this blob here. Rather than thinking about a sequence of gate operations, the idea would be. Well, let's come up with, say, a trap uh, in an appropriate way that would put electrons in, say, two different wells of this. And what we would like to be able to do is we would like to be able to um, take, uh, unfortunately, H is uh, used in three different ways here. It's used for hydrogen, it's used for Hadamard, and it's used for Hamiltonian. I apologize wholeheartedly for this, uh, but in any case, we've got, you know, I'll call this uh, H hydrogen over here. W the idea basically behind an analog simulator is to tune your experiment in such a way so that the uh, analog simulator, its Hamiltonian is going to be approximately equivalent to the hydrogen atom simulate uh, hydrogen atom Hamiltonian. And then effectively what you're going to have is these electrons at that point up to a change of basis, then are literally going to be bonded in exactly the same way that you would end up having in a molecule. So for an analog system really is just a tunable quantum system that is capable of having the, um, the, in principle, the same dynamics that you end up getting for the original system. This is actually very popular right now because of the fact that you know you don't need um, you don't need the same level of control that we've got for for this uh, for quantum computers. And on top of that, you can end up as a result scaling us to much larger systems. Um, Rydberg atom simulations of a thousand plus qubits are possible with analog. Whereas if we're looking at digital, you know, uh, we really struggle uh, doing simulations beyond about 12 qubits. So this sounds like analog comes up, uh, comes up like gangbusters, right? Because of the fact that it, it, it's much more, it, it, right now we can handle huge simulations. But unfortunately, I don't think that from my perspective, the way that we're approaching analog simulation at the moment really actually is solving the same computational problem that we try to solve with a uh, digital uh, simulation. The reason why is that our goal for simulation is this over here. We want to perform a sequence of operations on our quantum computer such that the error is promised to be at most epsilon. So this is something that's really cool because we guarantee that if you execute this algorithm with accurate enough gates, then we can guarantee you what the error will be in the worst case scenario, i.e. you can trust the results that end up coming out. And this is predicated on the fact that you can characterize and uh, error correct individual gates in a discrete model, but you can't do that with an analog model. In this case, what you need to do is you would need to do an incredibly accurate characterize, uh, characterization of the system in order to be able to guarantee that this relationship that you posit is true actually is close enough in order to guarantee that you're within epsilon air. And nobody knows how to do that uh, in a scalable fashion. So because of this characterization problem and the challenges on control, like to give you an idea, uh, to solve the FOMOCO problem with an analog simulator, what you would need to have is the amount of stability that you would need 
is you would need to ensure that the parameters that end up describing your system, you they would have to drift at a rate of um, one radian per uh, billion years of continuous evolution. And the IBM quantum experience or most other things, arguably ion traps might be able to hit this, but by uh, almost every uh, a quantum technology will have a far faster rate of change of the physical system than the amount that would be needed in order to be able to do a simulation like this within the air needed to make it relevant. So this is the big problem and why you, while analog simulation is neat, it isn't clear what we would need to do in order to be able to allow it to solve the, the, the computational problem that we care about. When you, Is that a question? Yeah, I had a question about the fact that like when you stated the Fermoco problem, you assumed that like the Hamiltonian given to you is like 100% the real system, like there's error there, right? So how mm. does that error compare with like the inherent limitation of the analog error? Because if the initial Hamiltonian was sort of close enough but not really the thing, then yeah. maybe we can do close enough but not really the thing on the second step as well. Right. Well, the difference is that the um, the um, the difference is that the with the analog quantum simulation, there's no way of systematically throwing more resources at it in order to be able to make it more accurate. If you've done a, a um, if you take a look at the cali uh, the calibration process, there's always going to be errors and there's always going to be noise, and there isn't a uh, clear algorithm that you can carry out in order to be able to reduce that error down to zero. With the threshold theorem for quantum error correction, that you can reduce down to zero. And we can solve that computational problem um, within air epsilon for any epsilon greater than zero. And so that's one of the biggest advantages. Yes, there's always going to be this issue about whether or not the Hamiltonian that you're programming in is the physical Hamiltonian that you care about. But our problem isn't even about the physical Hamiltonian. That's a problem for the physicists and the chemists. Our problem is given a mathematical model of, the, of a Hamiltonian, can we simulate the dynamics of that mathematical model? Then it's up to, of course, the user to decide whether or not their particular Hamiltonian is good enough for their purposes. Um, for this framework, have people tried looking like probably approximately correct, so not guaranteeing epsilon, but guaranteeing epsilon with a certain probability. And that, does that help the bounds a lot in this case? Or? Um, yeah, actually, um, it, it technically, te um, it, it, helps it, it helps a little bit for some algorithms. For some of them, uh, actually, it, it will be true uniformly. But depending on alg uh, uh, some algorithms that have an element of randomness to it, those forms, what we'll demand is we'll demand that it be less than epsilon with probability greater than two thirds, say. And then what will happen in those cases is it ends up d causing differences by um, 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 by logarithmic factors. Because what you can do is you can always use uh, statistical amplification you know, via you know uh, uh, majority votes in order to be able to take the uh, erroneous simulations and vote them out just by taking the median of a, of a bunch of other simulations. Anything else? Okay, cool. But now that I'm back here, there's one other thing that I wanted to address. I assumed that my Hamiltonian is a sum of uh, unitary matrices. Okay, that's something that's going to be useful uh, here for these uh, for these methods. But for any finite dimensional um, matrix, actually, without loss of generality, it's always a sum of unitary matrices. Does anybody see why that's true? I see a hand in the back, maybe. Is, is it because, um, like, the unitary matrices are closed under addition? Uh, actually, they're not. They're not. Yeah. Here, let me give you an example. This example is really cool. All right? So 
let's consider identity plus poly Z over two. See, I've spent too long in Canada. It's poly Z for me now rather than poly Z. They've been the, the, those, those uh, Canadians are just warping my mind. But in any case, this, uh, this matrix over here, when we add them together, is just 1, 1 plus 1 minus 1 divided by 2, right? Sum of two unitaries. And this actually is just the projector onto 0. So you can see very clearly, right, the projector onto 0 is a non-unitary matrix. So unitary matrices are not, in fact, closed under addition. They're closed under multiplication, but they're not closed under addition. And for a qubit, we have the poly basis. So you could just answer that together. That's exactly correct. So for because of the fact that we assume that our, our vector space is dimension 2 to the n, then we can actually use the fact that the poly operators form an orthonormal basis uh, for any matrix. And so in particular, um, what we can do is we can define the inner product between two po uh, poly operators, PI and PJ, where uh, PI is equal to, um, um, let's say, uh, I identity, uh, identity tensor Z, identity tensor X, so on and so forth going all the way down to, um, I don't know, Y tensor N. So what I mean here is these are the N qubit poly operators. Okay, and so now the inner product between two poly operators, PI and PJ, is uh, actually uh, defined to be one over two to the N trace of PI, PJ. And it turns out that this is actually equal to delta ij. So poly operators with respect to this inner product end up actually forming a orthonormal basis, just like they would for ordinary vectors. So you can think of poly operators actually more generally, just a cute way that you can represent any matrix. And it's, it's super neat that they also have physical meaning, but they're a beautiful operator basis. And furthermore, all of these guys are unitary. So if we have a generic matrix H, right? What we can do is we can end up saying H is going to be equal to the sum over I, AI, PI, where AI is equal to the inner product between uh, PI and H, which is equal to the uh, one over two to the N trace of uh, P-I-H. So this gives you a, a, a cookbook that you can use in order to be able to take any Hermitian matrix you feel like and express it as a sum of unitary matrices. And um, by the way, the delta I-J over here, just to give you some intuition for why it's delta I-J, if we take a look at poly operators, right? Poly operators are closed under multiplication. So the single qubit uh, bit poly group ends up up to plus minus i's consisting of x, y, and z. Now, if we look at each of these guys, z is of the form 1 minus 1, y is of the form 0, 0 minus i, i. This is of the form 0, 0, 1, 1. You'll notice that the trace of this, this, and this are all zero. In fact, the only matrix that has a non-zero trace is the identity, which the trace of it is equal to, uh, in general, two to the n. And that's why we have the one over two to the n factor out in front. So if we have two n qubit poly operators, and we multiply them by each other. If they're equal, then we'll get identity. If they're not equal, we'll get another element of the poly group. And a trace of any non-identity element of the poly group is always zero. And that's why this orthonormality property ends up holding. So it's really kind of beautiful that we end up getting this. And poly operators end up forming the exact same sort of role that we had before. They're also really nice because they're both Hermitian and unitary. And we're going to use that Hermitian property in just a second. 
to be able to uh, talk about Hamiltonian simulation. So this is why, without loss of generality, we can always think of any uh, any matrix, even non-Hermitian matrices, or I should say any square matrix, as a sum of unitary matrices. Okay, awesome. So um, any any questions before we proceed on to Hamiltonian simulation? All right, cool. So let's um, let me start Hamiltonian simulation with the way that I f I find uh, people respond to the most. Let's start by building some examples. And by the time we get through these examples, you'll actually understand everything you need to in order to simulate all of chemistry. <laughs> Because it's actually really not super duper hard, believe it or not. I, like even I could do it. So um, the, the moral of the story is, if we're thinking about simulation as compilation, then we need to ask a question is about, uh, we need to ask a question about what our gate set is. Now, ideally, our gate set should be discrete. It should be something like, you know, Hadamard, a T, and C naught. Or if you really like my favorite gate set, it would be Hadamard and Toffoli. I love that gate set, but we're not going to go down that route. Just to make our lives easier, we're going to deal with the following over uh, over complete base uh, uh, gate set. I'm we're gonna I'm gonna assume for the sake of simplicity, we have Hadamard. Uh, we have uh, X y z we have c naught and uh we have r z of theta for all theta this last bit over here is the first thing that's kind of a, a little unrealistic in our gate set because obviously um any gate set that contains an infinite number of elements is unphysical because you'd need an infinite number of bits of precision to specify each of those individual rotations in there but for simplicity, we're just going to assume that we can do every RZ perfectly. Okay. Um, so that is, uh, oh, uh, let's assume we got, actually got an S gate in here too. Um, so that is basically um, uh, all, all we need. And so our task is to be able to find E to the minus IHT and translate that into a sequence of gate operations for this. So we want to be able to turn this into a sequence of, you know, something like, um, you know, H, C naught, R, Z, C naught, H, some circuit that looks like this maybe. Okay? So that's our compilation problem that we want to deal with. And I'm going to deal with this one step at a time with the easiest possible simulation. So let's assume that we've got the uh, uh, the, e the easy uh, easiest case. Okay, actually, should I cover the easiest case or the second easiest case? Any takers? Easiest or second easiest? <laughs> okay, fantastic. You asked for it. Sadly, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit too much of a mathematician for my own good sometimes. The easiest case is H equals zero. <laughs> so if H equals zero, then we have E to the minus I H T, which is the operator we want to get. This is equal to E to the negative I zero T, which by Taylor's theorem is actually just identity. Awesome. Okay, so the easiest case is literally this circuit. <laughs> okay, fantastic. You've done the easiest possible quantum simulation. Let's go on to the second easiest case. All right, the second easiest Hamiltonian that we could do is a single qubit Hamiltonian of, of the form uh, H equals alpha poly Z, okay? And what we would like to be able to do is we would like to be able to build e to the minus i alpha z t equal to our unitary u of t. Anybody see how you, how we would do this? 
using the gate set that we've got above. Yeah, exactly. It's just a native RZ gate. So in this particular case, the circuit for our Hamiltonian, and by the way, this would be an appropriate Hamiltonian for a um, spin processing in a magnetic field, for example, and, and a bunch of other things too. Um, in this particular case, um, the quantum circuit would just be the following. It would be RZ of U of T. Okay, you might, some of you might be like, whoa, 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 whoa. What's going on with that too? Unfortunately, because of the definition of uh, the way RZ was defined in uh, based on the block sphere, it turns out that um, RZ of theta is defined to be e to the minus i z theta divided by a uh, two. And this is a sad but important definition. So there will always be these annoying factors of two that come around because we use this block sphere centric definition for RZ rather than the sensible thing we could have done, which is just define it in terms of uh, Z times theta, not Z times theta over two. But alas, I got outvoted when it, ca when it came to this. So now we're stuck with these factors of two. All right, everybody cool with this? So basically you guys have already done the Hamiltonian simulation. Let's go on to the third easiest case. Third easiest case would be alpha poly X. Anybody have an idea how we could do this? I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah, so basically, again, perhaps I'm too much of a mathematician uh, for my own good yet again, but what we're frequently going to do is we're going to keep on reducing our Hamiltonian simulations to problems that we've already solved. So in this case, we have uh, h equals alpha x. We can use the property that Hadamard x Hadamard equals z. And this implies, of course, that because h squared is equal to um, identity, that x is equal to Hadamard z Hadamard. Okay. So the operator that we want to build, e to the minus i, uh, alpha xt, this is equal to e to the negative i, uh, alpha h z h t. Okay, cool. That's that's kind of nice, but we need another theorem uh, in order to be able to use this. And this is a important theorem that if you haven't seen, um, it very well may change your life. Um, <laughs> this theorem is uh, the following. Let you be uh, unitary, um, then u e to the a u dagger is uh, equal to e to the u a u dagger for all bounded matrix A of the same dimension. Okay, so why is that true? Okay, well, whenever you're proving these things and the going gets tough, the tough use Taylor's theorem, all right? If you could learn nothing more from this, uh, this talk, learn that Taylor's theorem is your absolute best friend when you don't know what, what the heck you're doing. Oh, and um, I should also put a dagger here in order to make it right. So the proof behind this is really simple. If we just take the Taylor series expansion of e to the u a u dagger t, this is equal to sum from j equals zero to infinity of u a u dagger t to the j over j factorial. Now let's just take a look at what happens with u a u dagger squared. Well, this is equal to u a u dagger u a u dagger, but because u is unitary by assumption here, those two guys eat each other, and this is the same thing as u a squared u dagger. And in general, 
doing the exact same thing by induction, you we can end up seeing that u a u dagger to the n is equal to u a to the n u dagger. So that uh, using that property, we end up getting then that this is sum from j equals zero to infinity of u a to the j t to the j over j factorial u dagger, which just by resumming um, the everything is just u e to the a t u dagger. <laughs> okay, cool. So that shows that what we can do is by unitarily conjugating an operator exponential, we can take the unitaries into the exponent or vice versa. This ends up saying that this is equal to h e to the minus i alpha z t h. And therefore, the entire circuit can just be written as h r z of 2 alpha t h. Okay, wonderful. So, what would I do for h equals uh, alpha y? So, if I wanted to do the same thing, right, but now instead of simulating x, I simulate y, what would be my strategy? Yeah. So strategy is, and I'm going to be, we, I'll begin by diagonalizing H, then simulate using an RZ gate. That's actually it. And so in particular, the, the, uh, the circuit doing this, I believe, is of the form H. S um, uh, R no, actually, it would have to ask to be the other way around. S H R Z of two alpha T H S dagger. I believe that's it, but I might have had the order of the S uh, S and S daggers were reversed. So this is how we end up doing uh, doing one. But the central strategy is the following. What we do is we diagonalize our transformation. And then once we're, we, we've diagonalized, then we comp uh, compile a circuit for the diagonal form. Okay, that's just the rule that we're going to do in general. Okay, so fantastic. Now you guys actually understand everything you need to know about simulating um, well, you almost know everything you need to know about simulating one qubit uh, simulations. So because this is getting too easy, let's go on to the next case. Let's say that our, uh, we now have a two qubit Hamiltonian. That is Z tensor Z. Anybody know how we, we're going to solve this? Using control D. Control I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you there. Using a control Z gate. Uh, we're going, uh, sort of, sort of. What we're going to do is we're going to, believe it or not, because we're super uncreative, we're going to follow the exact same strategy that we did here. Let's see if I can, yeah. We're going to follow this exact same strategy that we did before. We're going to take a look at what this operator ends up looking like in its eigenbasis. It turns out it's actually not going to be controlled Z. Uh, but uh, but you'll, you'll see why in a second. So very first thing is uh, the following. Um, if we end up having um, uh, uh, H of this form, we want to build E to the minus I H T, right? And let um, Psi um, be a state such that H psi equals lambda psi. Then uh, it's easy to see from Taylor's theorem that e to the minus i h t acting on psi 
just by expanding the uh, this out, getting the appropriate powers of lambda and regrouping is just e to the minus i lambda t psi. Okay. So what we need to ask ourselves are is, you know, what are the phases that we'll end up getting for this? So first off, the eigenbasis for this is really easy. The reason why is because z is diagonal. So the computational basis uh, uh, is the eigenbasis for this. So in particular, eigenvectors can be written as 0, 1, uh, 1, 0, 1, 1, and of course, 0, 0. These are our uh, eigenvectors. So if we take a look at building this, uh, this matrix, let's just apply e to the minus i h t on 0, 0. Well, the first question is, well, what's the eigenvalue for z tensor z acting on 0, 0? This is just equal to 1 times 1 times 0, 0, because uh, 0 is a plus 1 eigenvector of poly z. So therefore, this is just 0, 0. So this guy is actually equal to e to the minus i alpha t, 0, 0. Similarly, if we do e to the minus i h t acting on 0, 1, what are we going to get? Plus i minus 1. Yeah, we'll get a plus one up here, e to the i alpha t, zero, one. The reason why is that the eigenvector for this is of uh, z tensor z acting on zero, one. That's equal to one times negative one, zero, one. And therefore, we flip the sign. So if we take a look at the overall matrix, the overall matrix for this in the standard basis is going to be e to the minus i alpha t, e to the i alpha t, e to the i alpha t, e to the minus i alpha t. Where, just to, to be specific here, I'm enumerating my basis like this. Okay. So, what's the pattern for where you see a negative sign in the, the, the exponent? Yeah, you'll see an even, uh, you'll see the negative sign when the parity of these two is even. And you'll see an odd sign when the parity is odd. Okay, that's cool. So now, fun fact, claim, uh, x, r, z of alpha, t, x, is equal to r z of negative alpha t. Anybody see how this is proven? Yeah. Yeah, it's proven by your by your new best friend theorem, right? This is just e to the negative i uh, alpha z t over 2 x, which is equal to e to the negative i alpha x z x t over 2, because x is unitary, and x z anti-commutes, so this is equal to minus z x, and this implies that x z x is equal to minus z. And so therefore, this is equal to e to the i alpha z t over 2, which is equal to r z of minus alpha t. Cool. So what this ends up saying is that we can flip the direction of this exponent up, uh, uh, up here just by putting a not gate around the outside of our, of our target. Okay, so this is here. Let me show you the easiest way of, uh, of doing this simulation. What we're going to do is we're going to have our two qubits over, over here. We'll have um, our state psi coming in. Now, what we need to do is we need to determine whether the parity is odd or even. So I'm going to put an extra qubit down at the bottom. 
This extra qubit for the uh, for the astute among you uh, won't be needed in the end. But I find that this version with the extra qubit is a little bit easier to understand. So I'm going to start with this one. So the idea basically is that what we need to do is we need to determine whether um, for a given input, we're in the even sector or the odd sector. And we need to do that by computing the parity. Now, the parity of two qubits can be determined by the C0 gate. Okay, so once we've done this, then this will equal, if this is the state A and state B, this state down here will be zero exclusive or A exclusive or B, which is just equal to the parity of A and B. So it'll be one if A and B are different, and it'll be zero if uh, they're the same. Okay, so now, what we have to do in order to be able to do the rotation is that in both cases, we're putting through a phase of, uh, of uh, e to the i alpha t. So we can do it in this, uh, this fashion. We can do r z of um, alpha t or actually um, no, that's not quite right. We want to do the RZ down here of uh, 2 alpha T. And then we'll flip back. Okay. And this is the simulation circuit that we end up getting for it. Now, after, after some simple circuit simplifications, you can see that this circuit can actually be reduced down to this. We don't need the extra ancilla qubit, but it's easy to, easier to understand because now we're storing the, uh, here we're storing the parity inside that qubit, which ends up flipping the direction of the rotation. It turns out that algebraically these two are equivalent, and we can just save that extra qubit. Uh, any questions about this setup? Okay, wonderful. So now there's, um, how would we end up doing the following Hamiltonian? Let's do Z tensor, Z tensor, Z. Okay, anybody want to tell me what the strategy is going to be for this? Yeah, the exact same strategy, exact same strategy. What we're going to do here is we're going to take a look at what the eigenvectors are. Let's add, take a look at 0, 0, 0. In this particular case, 0, 0, 0 is going to map to 0, 0, 0. 0, 0, 1 will map to negative 0, 0, 1. Uh, 0, 1, uh, 0 map to negative 0, 1, 0. 0, 1, 1 maps to 0, 1, 1. You see the exact same pattern over here we get a minus sign only if the parity is non the zero. So the way that we generalize this particular circuit is just by doing the same thing, but accepting instead of computing the parity of two uh, uh, qubits, now we're going to compute the parity of three. So our elementary form of the simulation circuit would be to take all of these guys, put that into a zero state at the bottom. Psi is put in for these three. We do three C naughts down here to compute the parity. Then we do R Z of two alpha T here. And then we do C naughts going back out. Wonderful. Okay. And this, of course, uh, can be simplified down to, the, to this form if you don't want the extra ancilla. Okay, great. So that's how you do it. And in general, if we wanted to do n copies, you do the exact same thing, except there's n c naughts.
Okay. Um, the last example that I want to cover is uh, let's cover uh, look at the case. Uh, hat, uh, H equals X tensor Z. How would we do this guy? Using hard rotate X into Z. Yeah, we do the exact same strategy. We diagonalize this, okay? And the way we diagonalize it is we apply Hadamard's in order to diagonalize the first one and reduce it to exactly the same simulation that we had before for the two qubit case. Doing that gives us the following simplified circuit. Okay, where this bit in here, this bit is just the simulation of Z tensor Z. Okay, so all we've done is exactly that strategy that you mentioned. We've done the basis transformation and kind of concatenated that inside a simulation of Z tensor Z. So in these cases, actually, to be honest, all we really need to do is understand how to simulate Z tensor N in general. Everything else that we're taking a look at, we can find by reducing that uh, poly operator to Z tensor N just by using cl uh, a Clifford gate conjugation via this Hadamard trick that we're doing here and here. Wonderful. Okay, so that's great, but unfortunately, it doesn't quite cover everything. The biggest thing that's left on the table is this gives us the ability to do, if we go back to our Hamiltonian that we specified ages ago in our problem statement, we assumed that the Hamiltonian is a sum of different UIs over here. So we've worked out what to do for any individual UI to compile that down. But we haven't talked about the, uh, what to do if we have a sum. Okay, so now, you know, let me, let me motivate this by a, another example. Okay, this one, a seven. Let's assume that what we have is we have H is equal to alpha Z tensor Z plus beta I tensor X. Shoot. <laughs> this one is hard, right? The reason why is because if we try to diagonalize this, the eigenvectors of this are the plus and minus vector, which is of course Hadamard acting on zero and uh, Hadamard acting on uh, one. Whereas the eigenvectors for this are of the form uh, zero, zero, uh, zero, one, just the ordinary computational basis vectors. So these bases are totally different. So finding a, a diagonalization in general for these Hamiltonians is rough because you're gonna have to have some knowledge of a particular structure that you can exploit in order to be able to figure out what the what the eigenbasis of the whole thing is. And that in general just can't be done. So we're gonna need another trick in order to be able to do this. And unfortunately, it isn't enough to just do the um, standard simulation. So how are we going to do this? Well, the way we're going to do this is the following. We are going to use this approximation known as the Trotter-Suzuki approximation. Now, I'm not sure um, um, about whether or not you want to see the higher order versions of this, but let me just explain how the low, lowest order versions of the Trotter-Suzuki approximation work. So first off, let A and B be bounded operators. meaning that the matrix norm of A uh, is less than infinity and the matrix norm of B is less than infinity. 
Okay. So in this particular case, the claim is that the um, if we have e to the negative i um, h uh, t minus e to the negative i a e to the negative i b t, this norm over here is in order um, norm of the commutator of a b t squared. Okay. So if T, basically, what am I saying here? Or imagine you had two numbers, right? I've got E to the two, uh, or E to the, yeah, E to the two. E to the two can always be written as E times E, okay? And that's effectively what the Trotter-Suzuki approximation is doing, except these A's and B's are matrices in these cases, or more generally bounded operators. And because their bounded operators, their commutator isn't equal to zero. And if, if the commutator isn't equal to zero, then this property over here that holds wonderfully for numbers because numbers are commutative, um, will not actually end up holding exactly for matrices. However, what the Trotter-Suzuki formula says is that in the limit where T becomes short, shorter and shorter, then actually the error in this approximation will end up going to zero. All right. And this this can be proven in a number of uh, different ways. Uh, what's the what's the easiest way for me to prove this? Any to any any guesses? Ah, uh, no, 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 because you, you assume that I'm more creative and I know more things than I actually do. Um, when the going gets tough, tough use Taylor's theorem. So all that you need to do in order to be able to prove this is actually just to do a Taylor series expansion of the two operators. And uh, H here, I forgot to mention, is A plus B. So what we can do is let's just take a look at the Taylor series of E to the minus I, A plus B. This is equal to um, identity minus I, A plus B, t minus a plus b squared t squared over 2 factorial. Now let's take a look at e to the minus i a t, e to the minus i b t. This is equal to identity minus uh, i a t minus a squared t squared over 2 factorial. Um, and then, um, yeah then what we're going to have here is we're going to get identity minus i b t minus b squared t squared over 2 factorial. And then there's going to be corrections that are of order t cubed coming out. And the fact that they're uh, corrections of order t cubed, uh, we needed to implicitly assume that the operators are bounded in order for Taylor's remainders, the remainder theorem to hold. Okay. So now this is what we we have. Now let's the in order to be able to uh, get our result, we need to distribute these multiplications through in the sub uh, bottom line. Distributing through, we get negative i a plus b t, and already you see that this is equal to the exact expression to first order. The second order expressions, on on the other hand. Uh, end up being a, li uh, a little a little bit different. So the thing is that we end up getting from the, the second order expressions is we're going to get minus a squared t squared over 2 factorial uh, minus b squared t squared over 2 factorial. Um, and then we're going to end up getting um, minus a b uh, t squared plus order t cubed. And that, that this term ends up coming from the cross term between the two linear terms. And the other ones um, uh, ended up uh, just coming about because of the product between the t squareds and the identity. Okay, so now we can see that the difference uh, between the two 
is up here when we square out a this we get a squared plus a b plus uh b a um plus b squared coming out of it and we have an additional difference between the two of um a b minus b a and so that is equal to the commutator of a b um and so that's why the error over here is upper bounded by the norm of the commutator between the two. So if you, um, and this is one of the things that's remarkable about the Trotter-Suzuki approximation, it doesn't matter how big these operators are, they could be enormous. If they commute, then there's absolutely no error in the Trotter-Suzuki approximation. But if they, um, if they don't commute, then we end up getting error that can be shrunk by the, the time step. Now, the next thing uh, that, that uh, is important is the following. If we end up having um, the, uh, this, uh, we end up having um, e to the negative i, a plus b, t uh, over now r, minus e to the negative i a t over r e to the negative i b t over r to the r um this is actually in order t uh, a norm of the commutator just move this off to the side commutator of a and b t squared um, over r. Okay, so what's that saying here? What I'm saying is that if we've got a long simulation and we break it up into r short time steps, what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, I'm going to break up my evolution time into a series of tiny little bins over here like this. Okay. And I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rapidly switch between A and B. And the analogy that I like thinking about is it, imagine you've got yourself one of the, uh, like a fluorescent bulb or actually computer monitor for that matter. It creates an illusion that the light is on all the time when really it's actually just rapidly flicking between on and off. And that's what we do, we're doing here. We're breaking everything up into these, into R, tiny little time segments inside which the two terms approximately commute. And then what ends up happening is that when we combine all of the errors together, uh, we end up seeing that in the limit of R going to infinity as we take this finer and finer slices, the exact same sort of thing ends up happening. That the, si that the, the simulation acts as if both terms in the Hamiltonian, A and B, are on at the same time. Okay, so that's the idea behind it. And in order to be able to see this, we can just use our previous result in order to show that uh, e to the negative i a t over r, e to the negative i b t over r. Uh, this is just equal to e to the negative i a plus b t over r plus some operator c, which is uh, a norm um, uh, uh, norm of the commutator of A and B uh, times uh, T squared over uh, R squared. Okay, so if we we um, we end up uh, uh, doing this, then basically, um, what's or what's the right way of thinking about this? Um, yeah. Okay. So the right way of um, thinking about this is that the um, expansion that we end up getting for this is uh, going to be equal to, um, yeah, cool. So if we have the um, expansion of uh, this operator raised to the rth power, 
Uh, what we're going to have is we're going to have um, e to the negative i, um, or what's the right way of saying this? Um, so let's say we raise this to the rth power, okay? The rth power of this is uh, there's going to be a grand total of um, of uh, um, r choose one different ways that we can end up having the c is c t squared term in. So just uh, because of the fact that the rth power is every possible string of this, the possible strings that we can have that have precisely one error showing up in it would be something like c t squared over r squared times e to the negative i a plus b uh, r minus one t over r. And then the next one would be e to the negative i a plus b t over r c t squared over r squared times e to the negative i a plus b r minus 2 t over r and so on and so forth. You see that every single time I'm moving the position of the air to a different point in the string and there's a grand total of r choose one of these different positions that I could end up putting this, which uh, boils down to an order r term here. Then, because of the fact that there's r of these errors, then this ends up implying that the error, when we use the submultiplicative property of the norm, and the fact that each of these operators is unitary, and thus has a norm of one, we end up getting that this is uh, order um, r choose one of a uh, norm of c, c squared over r squared, which is equal to order norm of the commutator, t squared over r. Okay? Just because you know, we have r different ways that the error can show, show up when we end up raising it to the rth power. And the fact that the error goes like one over r squared means that this is actually a favorable trade-off. If we had an approximation that had error order r, uh, one over r, then this wouldn't you know, any, be a favorable trade-off anymore and we get no benefit from slicing. But because of the fact that the error goes like one over r squared, uh, we end up getting that the, this factor of r times the one over r squared ends up still leading to a decreasing function in r. And this shows us how we can um, uh, decompose these uh, evolution operators. And so uh, I'll leave it there for the moment because you guys probably need a little bit of a break. Um, but let's come back in 15 minutes and uh, I'll show you how to put this all together. All right. So I think I think uh, most of you guys are uh, filed back now. So um, one thing, one question or comment that I want uh, that I wanted to make that somebody ended up raising is um, what about uh, the following, right? What we did is I, uh, we took a look at the Trotter decomposition for an asymmetric de uh, decomposition, but we could have considered it uh, for a decomposition of the following form. We could have considered it uh, with a symmetric decomposition. I a t over two. Now this over here, you can actually end up uh, seeing that this is in order uh, norm of the commutator of a commutator b plus um, norm of commutator b a b uh, t cubed. So symmetrizing this actually ends up killing off the dominant commutator term that we we end up getting in the in the expansion. So actually, in practice, people don't use the asymmetric formula that uh, uh, that I mentioned before. Fun fact, though, actually, it turns out that the asymmetric formula e to the negative i a t e to the negative i b t this formula uh for uh has error 
order t cubed when used inside phase estimation. So in particular, if we wa uh, wanted to apply, and I know you guys saw phase estimation from Jens's lectures the other, uh, other day. So if we applied phase estimation on the Trotter decomposition, e to the minus i, e, uh, b, t, what we'll end up getting from this is we'll end up getting with high probability an estimate of the eigenvalue of the um, uh, minus or the eigenphase of this operator over here, which will be approximately um, the eigenvalue of a plus b times t. Okay, um, and then plus you would expect actually from the uh, earlier stuff that this would be order t squared. It turns out just for the case of phase estimation that this ends up being order t cubed. The reason why is that this, um, this error, that uh, the commutator error that can be corrected by symmetry can actually be shown to be higher order uh, for the purposes of eigenvalue estimation. So most people don't know this, but actually, yeah, fun fact is that well symmetrization is actually a, a, a really nice way to reduce the cost of our uh, of our methods for dynamics it turns out when we're using this to compute eigenvalues like we would for phase estimation then um actually no symmetrization doesn't help you it's it just it's even slightly more expensive so that is um, um uh, one point that i wanted to make about it but let's go through this dumb, easy to analyze case and figure out what the cost of doing our full simulation is going to be for the case of ZZ plus I, uh, IX. So just to recall, our Hamiltonian that we were looking at before is alpha uh, Z tensor Z plus beta I tensor X. Okay, so that uh, A then would correspond to this guy here, and B would correspond to that one guy there. And so if we take, um, let's assume we have R splittings. Then uh, if we have R splittings, then our previous result says that the error is order um, the norm of the commutator between A and B t squared over r, okay? And in this case, the norm of the commutator between uh, the two is at most the absolute values of a, uh, alpha and beta. So this would be absolute value of alpha times the absolute value of beta, t squared over r. And we would like this to be equal to epsilon. And so this says that the number of time slices suffices <laughs> to be on the uh, the order of uh, alpha beta t squared divided by epsilon, okay? So this uh, implies that the total number of simulations that we need is 2r, and why is it 2r? Well, if we're using this formula for every slice that we're looking at, we have uh, to implement an e to the minus i a and, and an e to the minus i b. So that's why it's two times r, because for every slice, we need to do two exponentials. Because the total number of simulation circuits that we need is 2r. Each simulation circuit now is going to be of the form e to the minus i a t, um, e to the negative i b t which in our case would uh, can be implemented because B is identity tensor X. So this would be using our previous work that we did. It'll be Hadamard RZ of two beta T Hadamard X R Z of two alpha T and then this, okay? And we'll have to repeat this circuit that we have down here, R times. And so the total number of gate operations here that we ended up, end up seeing is six. 
So our total number of gate operations is going to be 12R. And this is uh, going to be in order uh, alpha, beta, T squared over epsilon. Okay. So this tells you the scaling of uh, the, the air. And now you'll note for the first time, something kind of uh, different happening. The difference is, is that before there was no epsilon scaling. We were able to exactly implement absolutely everything. Um, and here, unfortunately, um, we can't because of the use of the Trotter-Suzuki approximation. But we can guarantee that our simulation will be able to get arbitrarily close to the correct answer. So, you know, if this is e to the minus i h t, what we're guaranteeing is that our simulation is inside some epsilon ball over here. And the cost of building the simulation in general is going to be uh, alpha, beta, t squared over epsilon, uh, where this uh, radius over here is epsilon. So as epsilon shrinks, this cost is going to diverge, but we can make that cost, we can, we can make that simulation arbitrarily accurate. And this is again, the, the thing, one of the biggest things that um, simulation gives us is it gives us a way to have controllable and rigorous accuracy so it allows us to say for sure that we are actually simulating this insanely complicated quantum reality. Well, okay, maybe not insanely complicated for these two terms, but you know, in general, it, this would be the case. And so you can see then that this, th this is how we would simulate the sum of two terms. If we wanted to simulate many terms, then we can do the exact same thing, right? If we had, um, uh, let's say uh, H, is equal to, um, I don't know, A1 plus A2 plus A3, then what we can do is we could say E to the minus I H T is going to be approximately equal to E to the negative I A1 T over R E to the negative I A2 T over R E to the negative I A3 T over R to the R. Or if you prefer, we can think about this as just e to the negative i a1 plus a2 t over r, and then envision recursing the Trotter formula over each of those until we build up our entire product formula from this. So that's why it's sufficient to just focus our attention on the two-term case, because we can just uh, combine the errors that we end up getting from each of them. And it turns out in the end, the errors are additive. So this shows you how to end up simulating n terms in your Hamiltonian. If we have uh, a grand total of, um, uh, the, if we have the, the, the fully general case, sum from j equals one to say some capital N over here of alpha j, um, pj, where this, these are uh, poly operators. <coughs> Then our uh, cost for doing the simulation, we're going to uh, end up seeing will be on the order of uh, order n um, r. And r similarly is uh, going to be on the order of um, um, order uh, n squared um, T squared divided by uh, R um, max over J A J squared. Okay. So this uh, it ends up, uh, 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 sorry, I said R, I meant epsilon when we do the, the whole thing in the end. So this gives us a way now of taking any poly Hamiltonian and simulating it using these tricks that you've pulled off. And as mentioned, every um, uh, Hamiltonian is uh, um, every Hamiltonian can always be written as a uh, sum of poly operators. However, some Hamiltonians are more natural, of course, to write as a sum of poly operators. 
To give you an example of a one broad class of doing it is the problem of chemistry. In chemistry, the Hamiltonian is written in the form sum over PQ, uh, H PQ, A dagger P A Q, plus sum over PQRS, H PQRS, A dagger P, A dagger Q, A R A S. Okay, where these operators are known as creation operators. What they'll do is they say, create an electron and insight P. And AQ says delete an electron in site Q. So this thing over here, what it does is it does the following. It takes an electron at site Q and then hops it over to site P. This one over here takes two electrons in site R and S and gets them to scatter uh, off of each other into sites P and Q. Okay. So that's what this is describing. It's describing electron-electron interaction via these elementary hopping operators. Now, using a technique known as a Jordan-Wigner transformation, there's actually a direct mapping between the A and A daggers and poly operators. And that mapping is uh, AP dagger is equal to XP minus uh, IYP over 2 tensor um, Z P minus one going down to Z zero because I'm being a good computer scientist and counting from zero, not one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but in any case, that is the form of it. So everywhere, if you want to simulate chemistry, basically you just do what I told, oh, what I told you earlier, take those substitution rules stick them in here and look what circuits fly off. And basically this is the entirety of what we've done in the Whitfield B. Monte paper, which is the se uh, was the seminal paper on this I've done in about 2010 that showed how you can simulate chemistry on quantum computers. It literally followed exactly that same template that, uh, that we, we laid out. And so in principle, actually, as soon as you know th this fact and that fact, actually everything that we did was sufficient, is sufficient in order to be able to understand how you can simulate quantum chemistry in polynomial time. And it, it turns out that the cost of doing, of doing it when you substitute everything in uh, using these methods is an order n to the 11th, where n is the number of different sites or orbitals that the electrons can be in. So this is the kind of efficiency that only a theorist can love, <laughs> right? When I, given a choice, I don't know about you guys, but if I had to choose between an n to the 11th algorithm and an e to the n algorithm, normally I'll pick the e to the n algorithm over n to the 11th. Because at least with e to the n, the n to the eleventh term is going to be suppressed by an n uh, by an eleven factorial. Uh, n to the eleven is just going to take off like a bat out of hell. So this quantum algorithm is, you know, efficient, sorta, kinda. Oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake here. It should be n cubed. Um, but the um, but the um, fact is, is that it just isn't that great. Now, subsequent improvements in uh, chemistry uh, have uh, actually ended up bringing us down. We can rigorously end up showing uh, simulation um, in general that actually is um, uh, sublinear sub in the number of orbitals in some cases. We can uh, end up getting, I believe, something like uh, n to the two-thirds scaling is the best that we can get now with some uh, dependence on the total number of particles coming in. Um, but in any case, the, um, the point is that these scalings have dramatically improved from this basic idea. But already knowing this is enough for you to actually understand, in principle, how to simulate almost all of physics. And in turn, it's enough in order to be able to go back to that problem that I talked about to begin with right? Which is, 
how does the universe simulate a jar full of water? Now, admittedly, water is much more complicated than that Hamil- than the simple Hamiltonian that I ended up writing down below. But at a fundamental level, if we just viewed this as a bunch of elect- uh, electrons interacting using a Schrodinger equation, we are going to get complexity that will now be polynomial in 10 to 23, rather than exponential in 10 to the 23 by doing this. So now all of a sudden it starts becoming more plausible that the universe could be a giant quantum computer emulating these physics than it seemed when we were, took a look at this and thought and imagined that chemistry effectively was be, is being run in the universe in real time on a gigantic Turing machine that's secretly simulating the world, like we're all trapped in the matrix or something. Okay. So that's actually Trotter Suzuki. Um, there's a, 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 almost in its entirety. The one thing that you know um, I should mention that is worth uh, noting is that there are higher uh, order versions of this. That in general, using high order Trotter Suzuki, what you can uh, we can end up doing is we can end up getting the scaling going from order uh, t squared over epsilon. We can get this to go like order t to the 1 plus 1 over 2k divided by epsilon to the 1 over 2k um, for all k uh, greater than uh, or equal to 1. Okay. Um, the problem is, is that it turns out there's a, a k-dependent factor that ends up going like 5 to the 2k creeping along like this. And so because of this factor, you end up getting this tension between the two. When you optimize everything, what we end up getting is we end up getting complexity that ends up going like um, T times uh, T over epsilon to the little O one, where this little O one over here, what I mean is I mean, this is a sub polynomial factor. So meaning we can get uh, scaling with time that's uh, that's close to linear up to some uh, uh, extra factor that is smaller than any polynomial function. But it turns out actually in this case to be bigger than any polylogarithmic function. It's one of those weird, you know, awkward sort of functions that lies between, you know, lo- uh, logarithms and polynomials. But it's uh, it's smaller than any polynomial. So the... Um, the uh, moral of the story is, is that we can get close to linear, but we can never actually beat linear scaling. Does anybody see why it would be totally implausible for us to get better than linear scaling for uh, with T for a Hamiltonian simulation? You would do better than like the actual physical system? Yeah, that's, that's, that's some really good intuition there. If, we imagine the uni- if we're imagining the universe as a giant computer, if we could simulate the uh, the system faster than linear in T, we'd be able to simulate the universe faster than itself. But actually, we can do something even weirder than that, right? What we can do is we say we wanted to simulate, you know, our jar full of water, right? We could imagine simulating the quantum mechanics of that inside a quantum computer. But the quantum computer, this is a, this is physically a quantum mechanical system too. So. If we could do better than linear scaling, then why not simulate the simulation inside another quantum computer and do even better? But that's also another quantum simulation that we could simulate in better than linear time. So why not simulate the simulation of the simulation? And we could keep on repeating this until we'd be able to get our um, in our computation down to order one time, which is totally absurd. So that's a proof by absurdity that we can't uh, end up getting it, which unfortunately is not a valid proof technique. Although one that's frequently used in complexity theory. Um, <laughs> so, is that, is that a- <laughs> Let's get Bill in here. <laughs> um, but, uh, but in any case, the, um, the better proof is it turns out that if you could get better than linear in time, there's a reduction of uh, the problem of uh, parity calculation to Hamiltonian simulation. And you can end up showing that you'd be able to violate lower bounds on parity if you can end up ever doing better 
then scaling that goes like order t plus log one over epsilon. But there's a big gulf between the uh, this sub polynomial scaling that we we end up getting and the poly log scaling that's optimal. And so Trotter Suzuki actually to date nobody has figured out a way of bridging this gulf fully. Um, there's work that I did with uh, some collaborators uh, that partially give a way of getting around this by ex uh, through extrapolation of results from multiple Trotter steps. But there's no single uh, method that ends up existing that can actually end up achieving polylogarithmic scaling, which is a super bummer. Because we'd like to understand, if we're thinking about this theoretically, well, do we know what the ultimate Hamiltonian simulation algorithm is? Because it seems like there's a big gap between this scaling with T and the literally linear scaling that's optimal. Okay? So that's going to be the, the, the rest of uh, the, the topic that, uh, that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about a, another simulation method that can get you close. I'm not going to fully justify the argument for why you can end up getting linear scaling through a modification of these ideas, but I'll at least set, set that up for you. So the idea, or the breakthrough that came about is from this uh, idea LCU, which also similar ideas end up getting used in this family of algorithms known as cubitization. And so the um, idea of linear combination of unitaries actually goes back to that question that, that, uh, that was asked earlier. If quantum computers are great at multiplying matrices but can they be used to add matrices? And the answer is, yeah, actually they can be. And the idea behind, behind doing this is that what we want to do is we want to be able to figure out a way of implementing the sum of matrices as a subblock of a larger matrix or larger unitary matrix. So let me explain that. So I mentioned before that identity plus poly Z over two is equal to projector onto zero. I'd like to figure out a way of building this on a quantum computer. So how would I do this? Well, my claim is the following circuit will do it. Let's assume that we have an ancilla qubit up here that's zero, and we have a state psi down below. Let's imagine that we apply a Hadamard gate here, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the following. I'm going to do a one controlled Z down here. And I'm going to do something really stupid. I'm going to do a zero controlled identity. Okay, the astute amongst you, or those of you who are at least reasonably caffeinated, will recognize, wait a second, zero controlled identity? That doesn't mean a darn thing. And you're right. It doesn't mean a darn thing. It means do nothing. But I'm putting that in here because of the fact that the pattern will become a lot more clear when I talk about a more interesting case. So my claim is that if we perform this circuit and measure this over here and get a value of zero coming out the other side, then what we'll do is we'll map psi to the projector onto zero times psi, which will always give us zero. In effect, what I'm claiming is that actually by measuring this top qubit, we're going to measure the bottom qubit. So let's see how we can, uh, we can implement this project and why the circuit implements the projector. And the way we're going to do it, I'm just going to trace through the quantum uh, um, circuit. We have, after the Hadamard gate, we have 0 plus 1 over root 2 times psi. Now I'm going to apply the controlled Z to it which won't do anything in the zero branch, but it will apply a Z to it in the one branch. Okay. Now I'm gonna apply the Hadamard transform again to the first qubit. This will give me one half of zero um, plus one psi. <laughs> plus one half, zero minus one 
psi. Oh, z psi. Okay. Now, uh, what we're going to do is just regroup the terms. If we regroup the terms, we find that this is one half of zero identity um, plus z um, psi plus one half one identity minus z psi. Pretty neat, right? So what this says is if I measure the zero, what I'll get is I'll get psi goes to one half identity plus z psi, which again is equal to projection onto zero. But what happens if I measure one? Well, if I measure one, then the thing I'll end up getting is identity minus z over two, which is equal to zero, 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 one, which is equal to the projector onto one. So if I measure zero at the top, then the bottom state is projected onto zero. If I measure one at the top, the bottom one is projected onto one. So this actually gives you a way of doing, uh, uh, thinking about generalized measurements. If you want to build some kind of a projector in, the, in this form, we, we can always do it in this uh, particular template by using a reflection in this form. Okay, so that's, this actually also is experimentally used really widely in some platforms, especially things like circuit QED, where uh, you have an ancilla qubit that you use to measure a microwave mode. And effectively, you do exactly this linear combination of unitaries trick. And the reason why I'm calling it linear combination of unitaries is because of the fact we're using a circuit to add identity plus poly Z to it, to each other, which happens in this case to correspond to a projector. So this is how we can add two, two things together. That's, uh, that's pretty, pretty freaking cool. But we can in general uh, end up um, uh, doing this more, more broadly. And let me give you this, this notion that is uh, the present way that we end up thinking about this. Present way we think about this is in terms of a block matrix. So this um, circuit up here ends up implementing, let's, I'll call this ULCU here. ULCU uh, is said to block encode the operator IZ over uh, two and I minus Z over two. And, um, oh, uh, sorry, actually I did that backwards. It should be this uh, question mark i minus z over two and the assumption is is that the blocks are set up in such a way so that this corresponds to the ancilla qubit being in uh zero to begin with and this assumes that it ends in zero or one respectively so this will give this gives you the block matrix form of the transformation that we're carrying out on psi and in our case the state that we're looking at as a block matrix can be written as this. So you see that, you know, we're either going to do the projection onto zero or one with this. And we call this a block encoding because this non-unitary operation, this projector that we want, is all being drawn in inside a block of the larger unitary matrix. Okay, any questions about this? All right, so now let's generalize this concept. It's pretty straightforward to see how we would uh, do this to sum or difference any two arbitrary operators. If I wanted two arbitrary operators, U and V, then I would just end up changing these two operators from Z and identity to any two unitaries U and V. And then we could end up constructing the sum or difference between them uh, randomly. All right, now, uh, what we want to do, do next is we want to be able to generalize this. Let's, let's assume that we have a, the following. I'll have a decomposition that's of the form alpha j u, uh, u j. Now, I'm going to assume that I have a two subroutines. I've got prepare. And what prepare does is it'll map 0 to the sum over j square root of alpha j j 
divided through by a constant that I'll call square root alpha, where alpha is equal to sum over j alpha j. And furthermore, I'm going to assume that alpha j is greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Now, I can always assume without loss of generality that alpha j is greater than or equal to zero. Does anybody see why? You can just pull, push it onto the uj's. Yeah. Yeah, you just sweep it under the rug. Like if we've got a minus sign here, right, or a complex phase in general, what we can do is we can always just incorporate that into our definition of the unitary. So without loss of generality, we can take all of our alpha j's to be greater than or equal to zero. So that's how, that's the first operation. What prepare does is it, if we, we've got our Hamiltonian, there's two parts of it that need to be specified. The coefficients of the terms and what the terms are. Prepare, what it does is it, it prepares the, a vector containing the coefficients of, uh, of, uh, of this. And naturally, that isn't quite enough in order to specify the Hamiltonian. We also need to come up with a subroutine for giving us the UJs. That subroutine is, is conventionally in the field called select. And what it will do is it'll map a state J psi to J UJ psi. Okay, so let's just go back to that previous example. And I want to spell out what the prepare and the select circuit are for this. In this case, we're trying to co construct a 50-50 combination of identity and Z. So this is the analog of our prepare circuit. This part over here chooses whether the top qubit is zero or one to apply U or V or uh, I, I or Z in this case. And this portion over here is generalized into the select circuit. So this is the generalization of the trick that we had before. And I'll just go through and prove that if we, the following circuit will block encode um, the, here's my claim, uh, prepare, um, select, prepare, dagger, block, encodes the sum over j, um, alpha j, uj operation in the um, zero, zero block, i.e. it encodes it in like the top left corner of the, the block matrix, just like it did before. All right, cool. So let's, um, let's take a look at why that's true. So um, the circuit, prepare, select, prepare, and if I just draw it like a circuit, it would be of the form prepare, um, select, actually, I guess it would be this way. Um, prepare dagger, okay? So now let's just go through that. If we begin with zero up here and we have psi down here and block encoding it in zero, zero implies that if we measure this qubit at the top and we end up getting zero piping out the other side, then what will happen is we'll have applied our sum of unitaries to our state at the bottom. So that is uh, how this is, uh, this is all working. So we start with zero psi. Now we put it through the prepare circuit. This will end up giving us a sum over j, square root alpha j, j psi, divided by the square root of alpha, just by the definition of the prepare circuit. Now what the select circuit does, if you recall, is it'll take every j and apply a u sub j to it, uh, to, the, to the psi accordingly. So this under select will map to the exact same thing, except it what it will do is it'll apply a uj to each of the size, and then there's this pesky normalization condition. All right, and now if when we do prepare dagger, we are going to get a gigantic letdown because this circuit is will yield 
prepare dagger. Sum over J, square root, alpha J, J, U, J, uh, psi divided by root alpha. Yeah, and you might be thinking, and rightly so, come on, Nathan, this is totally lame. Like, you evaluated everything up to this point. Why did you leave it as prepare dagger? Well, the problem is, is I can't actually evaluate uh, this, this circuit beyond here. The reason why is I only defined the action of prepare on the zero state. If it acts on anything else, I really don't know what it does. So because of that, I can't come up with a uniform expression for this. But I can say that if I want the, the component of the state that's proportional to zero, I can express that by applying the following operator. Um, zero cat tensor identity. And this will end up giving me zero tensor identity prepare dagger sum over j square root alpha j j u j psi. So this over here again is just equivalent to what I said earlier. I wanted I want success to be the case when I measure zero coming out the other side. And everything else I want to be a potential failure. So I'm just filtering out the portion of the state that is uh, proportional to zero on uh, on the ancilla qubit, your qubits. All right. But fortunately, now we know the action of a prepare on zero just by definition. And that will end up giving at me the sum over J prime, uh, sum over J of root alpha J, alpha J prime, the inner product between J prime and J, um, UJ psi. Now, this, of course, is equal to delta j prime j. So this just gives me some, oh, oh and uh, there's actually also a uh, one over root alpha down here, and now divided by that squared. So this will give me one over alpha, sum over j, alpha j, u j, psi. There we go. And that demonstrates exactly what we wanted to do, right? What we wanted to do is I wanted to, I, I um, wanted to come up with a block encoding of this that will end up implementing sum over j, alpha j, u j. Now, one of the things you'll note is there's this factor of one over alpha in front of it out here. This factor of one over alpha is necessary because the sum over alphas that you're looking at could be large, like, sum over j alpha j could be greater than or equal to 10 to the 9, for example, in which case it would be impossible to represent that sum of unitary operators as a block of a larger unitary, because every unitary, right, has to have every row and column uh, be a unit vector. And if you end up having components that are like on the order of 10 billion or 10 to the 9, then you would end up uh, actually making it impossible to do that. So this normalization constant alpha that ends up coming in is what saves the day. It re it shrinks this vector, uh, uh, the vectors that you're trying to build using linear combination down to be become unit vectors at the price of a reduced success probability. And the probability of uh, success for this is uh, just equal essentially to the square of this guy, which if I call this matrix W at the top, this will uh, end up giving me um, psi W dagger W psi divided by alpha squared is my probability of success. All right, so now, I've actually shown you how to do something kind of remarkable. Does anybody see what that remarkable thing is? No takers? Well, what can you do on a quantum computer normally? 
Like, what? what's the point of a quantum computer at its core? Uh, I, I hear somebody saying something. Uh, can you repeat, please? Yeah, it's basically a matrix multiplication thing. A quantum computer it can approximate any um, unitary matrix multiplication. Okay. Now, does that give you a hint about what's remarkable about this this circuit? You do non-unitary things. Yeah, any matrix, any square matrix, and you know, by by doing tricks, you can always embed a rectangular matrix inside a larger square matrix. Um, can be written. We argued as the sum over J, alpha J, uj, which is equal to this W thing that I described at the top. This gives you a way to promote quantum computing from, a, from an engine that was only capable using the Mike and Ike style techniques of doing unitary transformations to one that can actually do generic non-unitary transformations with some probability of success. There's a price you must pay with, through that but you can actually get it to do generic linear algebra now. So this opens up a wealth of new possibilities. You can use this to simulate non-unitary dynamics if you wish, or you can use this to simulate unitary dynamics if you're willing to pay that price uh, for the probability of success. So that is the remarkable thing about it. And now we've met through this technique for the first time, we've got a way of actually turning a quantum computer into a general purpose linear algebra engine. And I find that really super cool. But let's use that for some for our simulation problem. Okay. Now, let's say that you didn't know anything about quantum computing. One of the uh, things you might think is you might think, okay, well, I want to simulate e to the minus i h t. Okay. What would be the dumbest way that you could possibly do this? Okay, Trotter might be the dumbest way, but apart from Trotter, what's the next dumbest way that you could think of of doing this on a computer? Taylor, yeah, totally. So uh, Taylor would be, you know, I would like identity minus H T minus H squared T squared over two factorial plus. I warned you that Taylor's theorem will be a central theme uh, in this uh, this lecture. But, um, okay, let's imagine for simplicity, imagine that H is unitary. Then, what's this guy over here? It's a sum of unitaries. Or, in other words, it's a linear combination of unitaries. So, what can we, can we do here? Well, all that we need to do is we need to be able to build uh, our appropriate uh, prepare and select circuits. So, if we wanted to do this just directly, what could we do? Well, our prepare circuit would be of the following form. Prepare would end up taking... Uh, zero, to, uh, or sorry, let's just take a look at our uh, our uh, operator bases that we're, we're looking at here. So the operators that we have would be like h, h squared, going all the way up to, because we got to truncate it at some finite order, let's truncate it at h, k. Okay, so that is uh, where we're going to go. And so our select operation that we would do, that's probably the easiest one to think of here. Our select would uh, map um, uh, state J psi over here and map that to J uh, H to the J psi. Okay, because all of our operators here are going to be either the Hamiltonian to the zeroth power, Hamiltonian to the first power, second power, third power, going all the way up to the kth power, okay? 
So that's what our um, select circuit would be for LCU. Our prepare circuit, oh, actually, I'm sorry, I lied a little bit. Um, our, it will be negative I to the J out here. Because remember I said that all the alpha Js have to be positive? So we've got to smush this part over here into the definition of our operators. But, okay. So then the next part is the prepare circuit. What this will do is this will map zero over here to the zero um, plus one, pl uh, or sorry, uh, plus uh, T um, plus uh, T squared over two factorial. I guess I need some square roots here. Plus uh, two plus uh, root t cubed over three factorial, three, so on and so forth, divided through by the square root of one plus uh, t plus t squared. Um, wow, okay, my t's and my pluses are totally illegible. So just interpret them to be the thing that makes the most sense rather than what's actually there. It's kind of like, you know, when you're looking at a physicist's calculation that uses the speed of light, just like multiply or add enough T's until everything makes sense. Um, but okay, so that's my preparer, my select circuit. Using the, the previous uh, uh, result, my value of alpha over here is this guy. Alpha is going to be approximately equal to e to the t. And so then the um the, the this gives this gives me a um a, a way of implementing the operator exponential using the the previous result the probability of success for this is equal to um, the psi um, w dagger w psi divided by alpha squared, which is equal to, um, in our case, psi um, e to the plus i h t um, plus order of uh, t to the k. And then we'll have e to the negative i h t plus order t to the k, I guess uh, divided by k factorial, I guess, no, k plus one, k plus one factorial should be down here, yeah. Okay, and then this is all multiplied by psi and divided through by e to the 2t, okay? So now if um, t uh, to the k plus one over k plus one factorial is uh, on the order of epsilon, then this is going to be on the order of one over e to the 2t, okay? And so the um, success probability, as you can see, falls off exponentially, which blows, right? The larger we end up taking t, the worse the probability of success is going to be for the circuit. But unfortunately, unfortunately, it's not fatal. And the reason why is because we can use a technique called oblivious amplitude amplification. Uh, did you guys cover amplitude amplification by any chance? No? Oh, okay. Uh, not, not two amplitudes. Amplitude amplification. <coughs> All right. So the basic idea behind uh, amplitude amplification is the following. If you imagine you've got a, a state that you want. I'll call the state psi good. And this is what you want. 
and you got a state sign on. This is what you start with. What we'd like to be able to do is we'd like to be able to find a way of rotating from sign on into side good. And that's the idea of amplitude amplification. And it does so by using two reflections. So it builds a walk operator that I'll call, um, I guess, R. Uh, yeah, no, I'll call it, mm, let's call it Omega, I guess, which uh, is defined to be identity minus two um, sign on, sign on times identity minus two um, psi good, psi good. Okay. And to imagine what this does, you know, let's, it's helpful to take a look at this inside a two dimensional space spanned by these two vectors. So, uh, let's consider this to be psi good. This is where we want to go. And we have a vector psi naught poking around out here. I'm going to assume that this angle over here is theta. Okay. So now what we're going, what we do is uh, the first thing is we do this reflection about psi, uh, psi good. Technically it's about the space orthogonal to psi good. So this over here, what it will do is it'll take the component of your vector in the direction of psi good and it'll flip it. Okay. So this is what we're going to end up getting after just applying that reflection. Now, if we reflect about psi, psi naught, uh, which is what we get by negative that term over here, then what we're going to do is we're going to take this vector and flip its component that is orthogonal to psi naught. So we'll get some angle up here that's of angle two theta. So if our state um, psi naught is equal in this parameterization to be sine of theta, um, psi good plus cosine theta psi suck. Then the pro, um, the, what we, we end up uh, seeing is that a single application of omega will map this to sine of three theta psi good plus a uh, cosine of three theta psi suck. We were, this is just the, some vector that's orthogonal to good in this two dimensional space. So this would be, I guess, psi suck down here. Okay. So that is the, um, um, this is what amplitude amplification does. And we want to do a variant of this to do, um, uh, boost our probability of getting the uh, correct answer, i.e. we want to boost our probability of getting zero. So psi good over here will correspond to us getting zero. And in, in our context, psi naught is uh, the ordinary state that we end up getting with uh, zeros coming in. The thing that's interesting about this is that we only need to reflect about all the states that are flagged by all zeros coming in. And that's the oblivious nature. We don't care about part of the state for this. And there's some caveats I won't bother getting into because we're short on time as it is. But the basic idea is that if we take a look at what the probability of success is for this, the probability of success after just one iteration will end up giving uh, being sine squared of three theta. Sign good. Okay, cool. So then ideally, what what we would uh, we would like is we would really like theta would be um, super awesome if it were um, pi by six. Does anybody see why it would be super awesome to be pi by six? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because then we get sine squared of pi by two, which is equal to one. So after, if this is true, if we had theta equals pi by six, then a single operation of this will map us to 100% success probability. But it turns out the angle pi by six is a special ang uh, um, uh, uh, angle or special probability of success. 
This corresponds to our probability of success equals to one quarter. So this is something really kind of fun. The best, with amplitude amplification, the best probability of success you can ever have going in is one. The next best probability of success you can get is one quarter. Weird, right? In fact, actually, if you had a probability of success of one half, you would want to artificially lower it to one quarter so that way you could boost it up to one. It's bonkers, but that is exactly what you do in quantum in order to be able to raise probabilities. You lower them to one of these magic angles for amplitude amplification and then use this trick in order to be able to boost it up to one. Sorry, can you repeat this? I missed this detail. So why is one fourth good? Okay, so if we take a look at this over here, say we want to be able to figure out theta, right? Our probability of success to begin with uh, is equal to sine squared theta, right? And let's set, set that equal to one quarter. Then this corresponds to finding theta equals arc sine of one half. And if you look at your special tables for that, that happens to be like pi by six. So that's why um, we want probability of success one quarter, because it, it just happens because of the special uh, properties of, uh, or you know, special angles here, that this actually corresponds exactly to what probability we would want to be it for one application of these reflections to boost us up to 100% success probability. All right, now, Let's take a look at this guy. Our probability of success here ends up actually going like the time. Now, of course, if you, we pick time equals zero, right? Then you'd have 100% probability of success, but you wouldn't get anything done. So how are we going to pick time then? Well, we're going to pick this so that the probability of success is 1 over e to the 2t, and we'd like this to be equal to 1 quarter, which implies that e to the 2t equals 4, which implies that um, um, uh, t is equal to ln 2. So, if we pick t to be long, uh, log 2, then our probability of success is going to be exactly equal to 1 quarter. And why do I want that again? Yeah, because if I, look, if, my, if I choose my t such that the probability of success is 1 quarter, then I can use this trick to boost it to 100% chance of working. And that's the whole idea behind this, uh, this approach. We pick these constant size steps, and we, we can use that in order to be able to boost our probability of success up to something that's reasonable and repeat it. So we need to make our time, uh, choose our time steps to be long log two. So if we wanted to pick a, um, a time evolution of duration t, what we'll do is we'll consider tiling now our time steps, instead of into these tiny, tiny, tiny little steps that we were taking before, now we're going to choose all of them to ideally have duration of long two. Going up to the end. And then the last step, you can do something idiosyncratic. You can change, you can purposefully lower your probability down to equal one quarter in order to boost it up in order to get it. But let's assume for the sake of simplicity that, you know, T is equal to R long two. Okay. Then you would repeat this a uh, grand total of r times. Uh, sorry. Uh, in what like in what units? Uh, oh, in this particular case, t is dimensionless because of the fact that I didn't. I my Hamiltonian over here. Um, I just said I said was a unitary matrix. So the natural units, though, to think about with t and h is that they're they're the units are inverse to each other. 
So you can pick the two units to be arbitrarily because every time you'll get a T, there will also be a, a, a Hamiltonian paired with it. That T was the time step, no? Uh, T is the time step, yes. But capital T here is the, is the total level. Evolution time that we want. And what I'm saying is that unlike before, we're, now our time step is going to be huge. It's going to be time long too. Okay. And, and now we're just using this, um, this fact that we can uh, uh, deal with this exponentially shrinking probability where we have P equals one up here, where we track it down to one quarter which will end up happening at ln two t. Then we boost it up to one, and we just repeat that process over and over again. And that's kind of like what's happening here, if that makes sense. So that is the simulation. Now, the, the one question is, well, OK, what's the value of k that we're going to need? It turns out that k is equal to um, um, what we want in order for this uh, to end up yielding small error is we would like our error, which is order um, t to the capital k plus one um, over uh, k plus one factorial. And uh, we're gonna want this multiplied by r. We'd like to have that equal to epsilon. So um, using uh, Sterling's approximation, this ends up giving us um, T uh, over um, K plus one to the K plus one. I'm uh, sorry, to the K plus one. There's an E up here too, um, is equal to epsilon. And then when we go through and find it, um, solving for K, k ends up equaling um, the Lambert w function of uh, t over uh, epsilon, which is in order log t over epsilon divided by log log t over epsilon. Okay. So uh, just trust me on this, Mathematica or Wolfram Alpha can go through and solve this, and you'll get a product log, otherwise known as a Lambert W function, when you end up doing it. Then you can go on Wikipedia to look up the asymptotics of that function, which will give you the log over log log. So this will tell you how many different times we need to apply the unitary. So in, in, in our context, then what's the cost? The total number of times that uh, that we need to apply the unitary is uh, select needs k, which is in order of log t over epsilon divided by log log t over epsilon applications of our unitary u. Um, and so, uh, uh, I have a doubt. Like. When we apply the amplitude amplification, that's uh, are we applying that only on the ancilla qubit or on the whole st whole? Uh... Yeah. yeah, actually, that's the interesting thing about this. Normally, uh, amplitude amplification is applied on the whole thing. In this context, we're actually only applying it on the ancilla qubits, and normally that won't work. But in the case where um, the post-selected upon success, the, the outcome that you're trying to amplify uh, is it yields a unitary transformation. You can show that actually it's possible to do amplitude amplification in this fashion. And that's where the oblivious part of oblivious amplitude amplification comes in. But the ancilla qubit and the others, the size state isn't like, they are entangled, right? So yes, if, you yes, yeah. if you apply the amplitude amplification only on the ancilla qubit, doesn't that change the state? of like the complete state. Oh, yeah, it does because we want, uh, and it turns out though, it does it though in a way that we want because we want to change the, rotate the complete state up to the state that we would have gotten if we'd gotten a success. So we actually want to leverage that entanglement in order to be able to do it. And it turns out you can go through the exact same analysis that we went through here in the, in the, in the event that we, you end up getting a unitary transformation coming out upon success 
and see that, yeah, actually it ends up working and this and this entanglement actually ends up carrying around the state for that we want for the ride. So the state of this, like the state side does not change when there's amplitude amplification oh, like happening on that pillar. Yeah, this, the state side does. What will happen is because of the entanglement between it, right? We're, we're, we're gonna, what we're going to have is we're going to have it rotated up to the good state and the amplitude of the bad state is going to be diminished. So psi, psi doesn't somehow become a tensor product. We end up using this technique to kill off this branch of the rotation. And, the, and that leads us only to the state psi good that we want. Even though, even though in this context, we're only reflecting the ancilla, but because the ancillas are entangled with psi good, it turns out to be equivalent. And like the uh, the Hamiltonian we are trying to simulate, it's non-unitary, right? Not, not not the Hamiltonian, but the unitary matrix that we are uh, trying yeah. to simulate. So in this case, in this case, the Hamiltonian, I assume for simplicity, is unitary. If it's not unitary, then our linear combination would need to just get a little bit more complicated because what we would need to do if it was uh, a sum of unitaries is now I'd have to break up this sum into further sum over j alpha j uj. And so it, everything goes through in exactly the same way, but in the interests of time, I wanted to focus on a case that I knew I could show in it entirely rather than uh, this, this case over here. But it goes through in exactly the same way because it's also a linear combination of unitaries when you replace H with a sum of unitaries. Well, but here, here, like in the end, we we'll have to measure here, right? Like, I'm sorry. In the end, we'll have to measure here. Um, well, actually, in this case, we're not measuring at all, no matter what. What we're gonna, what we're doing is we we want the whole ancilla register that determines which value of J is coming in here and also which value of K we're we're getting for a particular term we want all of that to be zero in the end and we're using amplitude amplification to make the probability of that measurement 100 percent. okay so in any case let me just get back to, to finishing up the uh the key point with this so select needs a number of unitaries in it but that ends up going like k and um so this implies that the number of uh u's needed in the simulation goes like t uh, k which is equal to order um t log t or sorry not little t capital t uh, that's not readable t log t over epsilon divided by log log T over epsilon, which, if we recall, the complexity of, of simulation is uh, in these units, uh, T plus log one over epsilon. So this algorithm actually is uh, individually optimal in terms of uh, the two. Actually, technically speaking, that's a little bit lazy. The tightest lower bound is the log log one over epsilon. So in terms of the um, number, the scaling with T and the scaling with epsilon, it's actually optimal uh, in, or nearly optimal in both of those individually. So this shows you how you can actually get really darn close using uh, post-trotter simulation methods to the lower limit and allow you to end up getting a, a Hamiltonian simulation, which is linear in T. So I'm almost out of time. But I want to leave you with some big, some of the big questions that end up existing in, in simulation. To me, the one that, uh, that haunts me the most in this space is the question of whether or not it's true that quantum computers, in fact, can simulate the universe in polynomial time. Not every physical theory that we know of actually can be mapped into this, uh, this Hamiltonian simulation framework. Much of physics can be. But not all of quantum field theory can be. And in particular, the standard model isn't known to be easily reducible to this, uh, this form. And so at present, we actually don't know whether all of high energy uh, theory 
can actually be simulated in polynomial time on a quantum computer. And that raises two questions. First, potentially it could happen that quantum field theory is actually more powerful than quantum uh, computing, uh, which would suggest that maybe we should be thinking about quantum field computers if that's true. The other possibility, which is even more evocative, I think, is that it might suggest that actually we're potentially not thinking about quantum field theory in the clearest possible ways. Because if we don't know how to compile our, uh, our theories down into something that a computer can execute, then I'm not sure we really you know, can put it on the same level of theory that you know, Newtonian dynamics say is, um, as an example. Understanding, of course, that's one, one aspect to, to it. But on a more practical level, getting the costs for quantum simulations down to um, um, good levels. Um, as I mentioned, you know, uh, the initial work for simulating uh, molecules ended up giving gate counts that were on order of 10 to the 14. And over the, the, the last seven years since the first uh, uh, gate counts were done, we've dropped this by about five orders of magnitude down to 10 to the nine. But the question is, how low can we go? And nobody really knows. Furthermore, you know, um, nobody really has a good understanding yet of how much of an advantage quantum uh, can end up providing for systems that may not actually be um, the Schrodinger equation. So if you want to look at differential equations, and in particular, nonlinear differential equations, which is a natural generalization of this stuff over here, we still don't necessarily know um, when quantum computers can end up providing an exponential advantage for those problems. And understanding that really will help us uh, get a, a grasp on when quantum uh, computation uh, ends up getting advantage and also what the computational power of uh, physical theories that might include some slight nonlinearities are. And so these questions are, of course, uh, uh, big ones. But, you know, to me, I think one of the things that also is really exciting about quantum simulation is it touches on so many fields. It touches on computer science, mathematics, chemistry, physics, and it's a wonderful opportunity to end up bringing a whole bunch of diverse people together to think about these problems. And it's my hope that by bringing all of these different voices to the table, that we'll not only be able to come up with quantum algorithms that are substantially more efficient than we presently have, but also potentially provide an answer to this question that's been dogging me for ages about whether or not it's fair to think about us living inside a simulation in a giant quantum computer. Thank you very much.